Okay, hello everyone. I want to welcome Milen from Liferay and he'll talk to us about microservices and basically what's the difference with modularity. So Milen, you have the word. Um, okay, the mic is working. Hi, right, good morning everyone. How are you doing today? Enjoying the conference so far? <laughs> yeah, not much to enjoy yet, but okay, I hope you will. Uh, okay, we're going to be talking about microservices and modularity today. Um, and let me ask you this question before we start. How many of you are using microservices already? Hands up. All right. How many of you know what microservices are? Okay, fair amount. I mean, a few people. That's okay for the rest, don't worry, because I don't know either. <laughs> but do you know Linux is an operating system? Oh, okay, good. Do you know this this thing? It's called PIDF, and it types something after what it does. You do? Okay, great. What it does? It displays the IDs of the processes that are named Java, right? Agree so far? Okay. So it's very simple common, right? Isn't it? Or is it? Now let's think about it for a second. What this thing does? is it has to go to some place where all this information is stored, look through all the processes, figure out those that have Java in their name, then figure out their uh, IDs, and then display them. So that's not that simple after all. Essentially, it's doing something like this. Now, do you know what the, the, have you ever tried the second one or anything like that? You know what the pipes are for? All right. All right, cool. So, what's the difference then? It displays the same result, almost. It's the difference is one is a monolithic application and the other one is microservices. So, if you ever done anything like this, you're using microservices. Yay! Go tweet about it. Now, seriously though, um, when I was first told about microservices, I was wondering what microservices are. So digging into the net, figure out that there is a quite good article by James Lewis and Martin Fowler, uh, which does not really define microservices, but instead tells you what are the characteristics. So basically what these guys are going to tell you is everyone who is doing microservices is basically doing these things. Okay. Um, and, of course, the article is much longer, you have all the explanations and so forth, but it goes to these nine bullet points. So it's componentization via services, um, dump pipes and smart endpoints, uh, and so forth. Now, if you have a close look into that, what you're going to realize is that about half of those things are not strictly related to developing software. What they refer to is rather organizational culture, how people uh, work, um, how they deploy, how they deliver. Like, it's about half of those that are actually really related to the way you build software. OK. So if that is the case, then why you should consider microservices? Why um, like everyone is telling you that it's a good idea? The most common answer I ever hear is it reduces the complexity. And by complexity, people mean a lot of different things. But in general, the, uh, the presumption is applications, monoliths, are complex, and we need to split them into the small pieces, and that's going to reduce the complexity. So let's see. Those are our microservices, whatever they are. And then we need to run them somehow. So we need something that is um, a, a server like an Undertow or Jetty or Tomcat or Vertex or whatever it's that you choose. Then you need to deploy it. And typically, in those days, everyone uses some kind of container. That's going to be the Docker or some other virtualization server or VMware, or whatever that is. Obviously, that's easy because now we have the cloud. So pretty much everyone goes to the cloud. But then you realize that although those services are microservices are distributed, and you still need to kind of manage them together, uh, things like circuit breakers and so forth. So you end up with a bunch of solution managing containers and so forth. And then you end up with another bunch of things that 
for example, is going to automate deployments of all those million services or aggregate logs or whatever that is. And once you've done with this, here we go, you just reduce the complexity of your application. It's now so simple. OK. <clears throat> so back to all the article, what you're going to read there and what I'm trying to tell you today is that microservices will basically help you shift the complexity from one place to another. And what's worse, it's going to shift it to a place that is actually much harder to control. So think twice before you actually do it. But if that is the case, then why everyone is talking about microservices? What's so cool about them? So a few quotes found in the internet. Uh, take a second to read and tell me if you agree that those are about that, that that's what about that is what microservices are all about. Those of you that raised your hand that you know that you're using microservices, you agree? Yep, yep. I just heard one person. It's only one person agrees. Okay, two. Everyone agrees or no? Okay, I hear some people saying no. That's good because those quotes come from back of the year 99, 2002, and are about EJB. But you hear people, them using, people using them all over the place these days about microservices. And back in these old days, uh, there was a report from Gartner, which is no longer online, but you can use Wayback Machine to find it, uh, that says that the companies back in those days have overspent $1 billion around on a technologies they were told they need. They didn't actually need them, but that's what software vendors made them believe. Um, now, how, how is that related to uh, today's world, where we have a bunch of big players uh, selling cloud services, convincing everyone that they need to use microservices? That's up to you to decide. OK, so next thing that you need to think about microservices is, OK, who is doing microservices? Who I'm you know, compare myself to. So a few of the biggest names out there, you probably know at least a few of the companies listed there, are claiming that they're doing microservices and they're very successful with it. Um, and that is actually true, they, they don't lie. Now, what you need to ask yourself is though, what these companies have in common? Why are they successful with microservices? And if you think careful about that, they build microservices for their own needs. Those are not software vendors. Those are not service integrators. They do not go build infrastructure for someone else. They build services that they use for their own purposes. They do sell ser other services to their customers, but they have their own IT teams working on, on, on that approach. It's a well-trained, uh, well-suited as an organization for the way of work they do. That is why it's easy for them. It's easy for them to say, OK, this is going to be our culture. This is how we're going to work. And, uh, and we'll be successful with that. Now, if you are a software vendor or a service integrator or a company that builds software that sells software, you can't just go to a customer and say, you know what? We have this great product. It's going to solve all your problems, except you need to fire these guys, hire these guys, and, and, and change your whole company culture. It just doesn't work that way. OK, and one of the important things is that if you have a team that is very skillful and it's successful it, with some technology, it doesn't mean that every other team will get to that technology and be as successful as that, uh, the, the original team is. So keep that in mind. So the question comes, should you do microservices? And the answer is, are you, your company, much like those guys? If you are, then probably yes. Then probably you can change your culture. You can fit um, into, that, uh, into that trend and, and, and be successful. Um, it, it does not guarantee success, obviously, but it, it, it raises the chances. Um, otherwise, you should really consider uh, whether or not you should do it. And in fact, a good piece of advice, again, from Martin Fowler and um, uh, James Lewis, is that you should not start with microservices. You should start with a monolith. I hate that word. And uh, keep it modular. 
Now, if you have a modular monolith, and you reach the point where you realize that microservices are actually bringing value to whatever your thing is, then it's very easy to move from a monolith that is modular to a microservices. And if you never reach that point, you don't have to. So what else, if not microservices? Now, here is the point where I need to state it clear. Microservices are not the cure for complexity. They do not cure complexity, and in fact, nothing cure complexity. And you need to understand that and remember that. The complexity of an application comes from the domain. If you are building a banking software, the complexity comes from the banking domain, because they have you know, accounts, transactions, whatever that is. If you're building a telco software, the complexity comes from your telco domain. There is no way to reduce that complexity by splitting your application into, uh, uh, into microservices. You, you can just not expect that this is automatically become uh, more simple. So there is no cure for complexity. And in fact, we tend, as the developers, we tend to look at the solution that's going to be like one and once and forever solve the problem. But in some cases, there are no cures. There is just a condition that's going to persist, and we need to deal with it constantly. And this is what is known as a treatment. So we don't cure the problem, but we learn how to live with it and how to treat it and, uh, and how to um, make a good solution on top of, of, of what we have. And one of the best things you can do is to design a clean, modular architecture. Once you have a clean, modular architecture, you're dealing with the complexity. You're not getting rid of the complexity. You don't say, yeah, it's, no comp it's not complex anymore, but you need to say, yeah, it is complex, but I know how to deal with it. Okay? In fact, a guy called Uncle Bob, probably heard of him, uh, says, there is no such thing as microservices architecture, because microservices are a deployment option. Well, he also says a database is a deployment option, so uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it may sound strange for a lot of you, but that is, in fact, true. That is an option that you can choose to use or not. You don't have to focus yourself, say, oh, everyone's doing microservices, so I'm going to do it as well. And this is the point where typically people say, well, yeah, that's nice, cool, but you know, in my project, this doesn't work because you know, of this, because, because it's too complex, because it's too monolith, whatever that is. So, demo time. So I'm going to show you how to actually modular, uh, uh, con convert uh, what is a modular, uh, sorry, a monolithic application into models. Anyone, who here knows Duke's Forest? One person? And you're all Java developers? <laughs> no. I was that's a surprise. Okay, so Duke's Forest, that's a what used to be Sun, now it's Oracle demo application for how to build Java enterprise applications. Right? So that's the that thing that you see there. It runs on Glassfish, uses all kinds of JSF, EJB, um, you name it. Java EE, anything, it's in there in that application. Okay, so let me quickly show you. Uh, they don't have anything to t quickly test it, so I'm just going to show you how that looks from the uh, uh, user interface perspective. So uh, if you log in, oh God, that's slow. So you can manage some products. Uh, uh, you, you can show those categories and products you can buy, and, um, and so forth. That's all one WAR file that runs on, well, actually three WAR files, but. That uh, doesn't make it any different. Uh, that runs on a on a glass fish. So the idea is now you you have this running production, and someone comes to you and says, "Okay, uh, you know what? We are building this new project, and we need a catalog service. We just want to show products in a catalog to people. Can we just grab whatever you guys already have and use it?" I say, "Sure, go ahead. Just grab it." So if I'm the person who wants to take this catalog thing, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look into the source code and try to figure out where this is. What I typically do, by the way, can you read from that screen? Is it big enough? OK, good. So what I typically do is I run a tool called jdepend, 
Um, sorry. Uh, which gives me gives me a rough idea of, uh, and it doesn't work for obviously. Uh, let me see. Ah, okay. I need to compile the thing before it, it gets the classes. So give me a second. Uh, that's Glassfish. So install. It's gonna take a second. Close that. Yeah, so this is so monolithic that it even the build script doesn't run unless you have Glassfish running. Uh, okay, so let's run the report again. Okay, so this tool produces a package relationship diagram, which rather tells you, uh, you probably cannot read it, I'll make it a little bit bigger for you. Uh, can you read it now? Right. It, it don't have to read it, but uh, just to, so you don't see just the squares. Um, so basically, this tells you what are the relationship between packages, and you look into that. It's like where is the catalog thing? It's like it's EGB, JSF, where uh, UTO. It, it's not there. So your only option is to now go and dig into the source code, try to examine all the files that you suspect may be related to your catalog thing, try to extract those things and do something with that. Well, let's see how we, can, uh, how we can change that. So we don't have a lot of time. So I'll, the, the code, what I'm going to be showing you right now, I'm going to be taking uh, git commits, and I'm just going to be telling you with few words what I'm doing there. All the source code, everything is in GitHub. So if you want to deeply examine the changes, then feel free to go on GitHub and get the source code and play with it. I'm just going to give you a rough overview of what I'm doing so you get the idea. So, uh, so I have this demo script which grabs some stuff from Git and display it. So first thing I do is I rename all the entity classes because if you look into the original old code, they have thing called an entity that's tightly related to JPA. And I don't want to depend on JPA, I just want to have an entity model. And so I'm just getting and changing those a little bit. Um, you can quickly see the differences here. Um, I don't have to read it. This is just, there is no logic change. This is just refactoring, shifting things from one place to another and renaming files. That's all I do. Okay? Uh, and so just reorganizing things a little bit. So in the next commit, I create a modules for uh, use cases. And basically, what you see here is on the left hand side is the old code, the new code is on the right hand side. So basically, I created three modules that I called use cases catalog, use cases commerce, and use cases identity. And this is basically where all my use cases will live. So I'm kind of clearly separating um, um, concerns. OK, let's do it one more N next step. So now in this commit, um, I'm uh, extracting those entities into, uh, like uh, the entities are already extracted. I'm now extracting a JPA implementation that's going to persist things in, the, uh, uh, in a database and moving some more logic from one place to another. Again, there is nothing, uh, no logic change here. It's just shifting functionality from one place to another. And uh, now I'm restructuring the EGB in, and the web layer. So I'm basically grabbing the logic that was in the EGBs, messed up with JPAs and all, and, and JSF and all the other technologies, and extracting it into those models that I created um, uh, into the use cases. Uh, and um, again, there is no logic change. It's just shifting code from one place to another. And uh, finally, I'm reorganizing the Maven modules, so I would have now a lot more modules that actually is going to uh, represent, uh, on a file system level, the structure of my application. So you see now Duke Payment and Duke, so you may not read it, but those are the old modules, they are gone. And instead, here we have a J, uh, Java Enterprise apps, here we have some resources, uh, as a shipment module. Uh, and so forth. It's just organizing code on a file system, nothing, nothing more than that. OK, let's build the whole thing again now. Uh, it's going to be install again. Uh, and now you will see before we had only these three or four modules. Now, it, when the Maven is done, 
uh, you will see that we have a lot more modules in there. The code is separated uh, into um, modules and submodules. So that's, that's basically what we did. We just refactored the, exa the existing code. OK, and if, you, if I run the JDPen tool again, uh, let's see. Here we go. Now, the dependency graph looks like this. So for a reminder, this was the one before. This is the new one. And you can see, actually, here that we now have a clear use cases. Those packages are representing our use cases. So now we have a catalog use case, an e-commerce use case, and an identity use case. We have some persistence in here that, uh, that, that kind of stores whatever it needs to store. And then we, need the, uh, we, we have these wiring packages here that are basically putting things together. So they wire one implementation with a, with a persistent and everything. And on the top of that, there is the UI layer, which is a web application in, written in, uh, in Java service phases in this particular case. But it's rather clear what leaves where. That all of a sudden is the same monolith, but split it into modules it, that have a sense. So if I, just to make sure this still works, let me try to restart this application again. So yeah, it still does work. It, I can still log in, I believe. Yeah, here we go. So I can see customers and so forth. So that is the exact same application. Nothing changed. I just reorganized it. What can I do next? Now, I'm this guy who wants to build this external thing. And I'm going to be building a microservice for the catalog thing. So for the microservice, I'm going to be using Spring Boot. Who knows Spring Boot? OK, a few people. The rest of you, it's one of the most famous uh, frameworks for building microservices these days. So that's my code. I'm just creating a new module called catalog microservice. And I'm using the use case that I extracted, the catalog use case that I extracted, and um, just wiring it here. And I'm wiring it to a memory database, so every time I change something, it, uh, I redeploy, it's going to disappear. But nevertheless, this is the, the core logic is still the one from the monolith application. I'm just building another module that is making use of it. So let's build this. Uh, it's going to be building the whole thing again every time, but OK, in the meanwhile, uh, I'm going to stop the glass fish because we don't need it anymore. OK. OK, and let me have a live ray running in it, because we're going to need it later on. OK, so this is going to be starting here. So you see, I now have this catalog microservice here compiled. So let's see how that works. I'm going to switch to another console. And this is going to be into Duke's Forest Catalog Microservices target. And if you know Spring Boot, you know that it generates an executable file. So I'm just going to do Java jar catalog microservice jar. That's going to start Spring Boot. And it's going to run. Um, a application. So I also used a uh, JSON doc. That's a tool for uh, web REST interface. So let's see how that works uh, without the UI. And I have created some web services, REST services, for that same thing that we have there, the catalog. So you can see here, I have a category service and a product service. Uh, and 
I just built a micro, uh, an application that exposes a REST API using Spring Boot out of the very same source code I had into a, uh, from a very monolithic uh, application. Uh, in fact, you can see that I can uh, uh, create, and I'm not going to do this because we are going to be running out of time. Oh, maybe just once so that you trust me. It really works. It's not a fake thing. Um, so I'm sending a JSON here, uh, submit, and then I can actually list products uh, here. Uh, where it is, products. Uh, okay, life race starting. Uh, submit, and here is the result. So that's a fully functional REST service. It, it, yeah, you probably don't read it, but uh, it's a fully functional web service, standalone application, just using one jar of the very complex application um, uh, that I had. Okay, so what we can do next? Now, this was the buzzword, microservices. Now let's go to some scary words. Anyone heard of OSGI? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's convert our modules, our jar files, into bundles. Like bundles are uh, the deployment unit in the OSGI environment, and a lot of people get scared about bundles. Actually, bundles are simply jar files, and they have a very um, specific field in their manifest files that describe what needs to be where and so forth. That's, that's all they are. Um, so, in order to convert a jar file into a, uh, a bundle, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, all you need to do if you're using Maven uh, is just put something in your POM file and say create a bundle out of it. If you're using Ant or Gradle, there are pretty much similar techniques. And there is a tool called BND, and that tool is going to generate uh, from your code all the information that needs to be in a manifest file and create a proper bundle for you. So once you create a proper bundle, then you also start creating things. Like in this particular case, I'm going to create two things. I'm going to create a noise GI service, which is more or less the equivalent of the uh, uh, Spring Boot thing. And I'm going to also create a shell command. I'm going to show you what a shell command is later on. So how you create, uh, let me actually show you that. So here is a product service. Uh, and that's, that's all I do, actually, in OSGI. I'm just saying that this is going to be a component. It's going to be exposed as a service. And it's going to reference another component, which is here. Um, and basically, that's it. An OSGI service there will take care of the rest. And I also can create a command. So here is my product command. Well, I'll say I'm actually going to have three commands. And their actions are implemented here. And you will see how commands are used in a second. OK, so now let's also create a REST endpoint for that very uh, OSGI service. So that's another comment. And basically, if you look into that, what all you need to do is that's a standard JAX uh, web, web service, nothing, nothing special in it. It also uses OSGI annotations, uh, I'm sorry, declarative services annotations to, um, to connect to another component. And we also, the rest is just a bunch of jar files that we need to provide in order for, the, um, for starting up something that's going to serve uh, requests and responses, basically an embedded uh, web server. So let's build that thing again. And I'm going to need another terminal. Uh, OK, I get it. And I also have an OSGI runtime called Felix. That's one of the, um, the, the, the implementations. Let's clear the cache. Uh, OK. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, I cannot do install anymore because Glassfish is not running, so it has to be a package. I keep forgetting that. Don't be a long time. Okay, should be okay. Here we go. Uh, 
So this now is also going to build a few other models. So you see we have OSGI services, catalog service, uh, go, uh, catalog com uh, ca commands, and REST endpoint. Those are the jars that we're going to need in the Felix runtime. So uh, clear that again, and uh, Java jar bin Felix jar. OK. So when Felix starts, well, it depends on how you configure it, but normally you're going to have the console. And this is where we're going to use our commands. So you can use things like list bundles. And this is going to tell you uh, what exactly is inside the OSGI environment. So you see there are a bunch of things in there. Uh, and you see that uh, we have things like catalog management use cases, uh, the one that we use from the monolith, catalog service, and so forth. So let's see how. Uh, and we also have our REST service. And in this case, we're going to use another thing for um, uh, REST UI, which is, um, someone help me with the name. Uh, uh, OK, forgot it. Uh, never mind. It's just another client um, for, for web services. And what you see here is we only have one service this time. It's called product. And we just gonna just can get products which gets nothing because we don't have any product. But this REST service does not give us any interface to actually create products. However, what we have is a comment that we created for this shell here. So I can now say product add test test, and it's going to cost 12 something. And I can also say product list. I can see my products, but moreover, I can actually now go and try this out, and now I see I have my product, which I just created from the common line. And that's the, two, that's the thing that kind of OSGI gives me. OK, so I got a monolith application. I created a web service using Spring Boot. Now I build the same thing using OSGI and also have a REST service for this. And that is only because I was able to split uh, split my application. Now, that is the moment where a lot of people say, well, but OSGI is so complex on its own, right? It's, it's just so crazy uh, that you're just moving from one app server to another. Wait a minute, we have bot running here, and uh, Spring Boot is by most of the people, um, uh, um, the, most of the people think about it as a very tiny little one. That's why they call it microservices. So, let me show you something. You know this tool? It's called Java Visual VM. And it shows you some really interesting things about your applications. So here is my catalog microservice jar. Uh, and here is my Felix. So let's look into this microservice thing first. Uh, it is a microservice. A single one, you cannot run another one. That is an application per service. That's it. Done. And it uses, at the moment, about 250 megabytes. The heap is 700, and it loads over 5,000 Java classes. That's what you get for a microservice, a single one. OK, now let's look into a Felix. It's a container that can handle multiple services. It has 250 megabytes of heap and currently uses about 50 megabytes and loads about 3,500 classes. And I can add more services to that at any time and add them and remove them dynamically. I don't have to restart anything. Right? So next time someone tells you OSGI is so huge and so complex and so slow and microservices on Spring Boot are so great, you know what to show them. OK, but back to our demo. Uh, here we go. So now I'm going to go one step further, even more scary word, portals, portlets. Who knows portals and portlets? Hey, a few people. OK, because I work for a company that builds portals uh, called LifeRay. So that's obviously an interest for me. So let's create a portlet for LifeRay. How complex it is? Well, basically, I'm going to be using our li uh, LifeRay 7 milestone, which is not released yet, but uh, it's the implementation that already natively supports OSGI. And basically, 
I just create a file. I say it's a portlet. I provide a bunch of properties. I register it as an OSGI component. And I want you to remember those couple of lines here, because this is going to be important in a second. Um, the reference here says it's dynamic and it's optional. So we are referencing a catalog service that is dynamic and optional. And right in here, we have an if statement that says, if that service is here, display something. If it's not here, display something else. You will see how that is important in a second. OK. Um, so uh, let's build that. OK, we only have 10 minutes. I hope I'm going to make it. On time, and let's go to our uh, life ray, which should be here, started somewhere, maybe here. Oh, here we go. That's life ray. I'm gonna log in, and I already have a page called catalog. Ah, okay. Sorry, forgot to do one thing. Um, give me a second. Uh, forest, portlet, catalog, target. Ah, not, not the portlet, the service. Uh, you skip. Where is the oh, SGI catalog service target? OK, because I was missing the service. I'll give it a second. OK, so now it displays nothing because we don't have any services. And if you remember from Felix, what we did, we used the console to create the service. But we don't have a console here, right? So how we can create a product? Well. That's not uh, totally true, because what we need to do is do this. And now I just turn it inside the portal. And I have a shell there. And if you uh, look into that, you will see that I also have the bundles and so forth. So I can now say here, product add test 2, and it costs 20, so whatever. And if I refresh my page, uh, now, I, now I have a portlet that uses the exact same service. And also, I, I can tell net in there and, and manage it. OK. And so what you're going to ask now is, wait a minute. That's still everything you show. It's still one JVM. It's still uh, you know, one monolithic thing. So how we do this into a um, distributed infrastructure? Well, luckily. OSGI has something that is called distributed OSGI. And that is the final thing that I'm going to show you today. Uh, it's a few comments. Basically, what you need to do to make your OSGI service distributed is to add this green thing here. It's basically saying, there is a service, and I want to export the interface. And that's going to make it so that your service is remote. And you also need a bunch of uh, jar files uh, that make this thing work. So let me. Build it one more final time for you. OK. And meanwhile, I'm going to go and stop Felix. Uh, OK. Not, not this one. OK, here we go. So if I. Now display this thing again. You will see there, there is, because it's in memory storage, so the product is gone, so it displays nothing. And now let me show you what's going to happen if I just go ahead and remove the service file. So this is the service bundle deployed in, in LifeRay. So I'm just going to remove it. Gone. Now if we re reload this, now I see a different thing. Now, that is the moment where you need to remember the if statement that I, told you, that I showed you earlier and the dynamic linking thing. So in OSGI, you are telling, you live with the fact that services can appear and disappear at any time. 
right? And you need to be aware of that and code with that in mind. So every time you build an SGI application, you're actually building a distributed application that runs on the very same JVM. So all the concerns of distributed programming are still kind of on, on, on the back of your head, it's just that st for the meantime, it runs in the same, uh, in the same JVM, which ob obviously makes testing very easy. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and run Felix again. Uh, where that was? Uh, that's not here, sorry. Uh, had too, too, too many consoles. OK, so let's now run Felix again. Let's bundles. And that's a different application running in different JVM. And if you reload this, I just need to give it a few seconds. Uh, come on. Need some discovery to take place. Uh, let's see. Maybe I screw up. OK, never mind. Can, cannot show you this, but we're running out of time. Ah, here we go. Uh, maybe it, it just deployed. Maybe one more for you. OK, when something went wrong. But uh, basically, what's going to happen is it's going to grab the service from the, the Felix, if you don't make any stupid mistakes like I probably did. Uh, and it's going to use that. It's going to have a uh, remote connection uh, in between the one application and the other one. It provides you, the, well, you provide the discovery services and so forth. Uh, and so for the, the clue is, from your perspective as a developer, whether you're building a local thing or a remote, a distributed application, you still apply the same concerns. It just makes it so much easier for you to test your application. Um, sorry, I can show you probably that later. Um, anyway, the conclusion and what I wanted to, to give you today is we started from this. We had one glass fish. And we had a four modules in there, but those modules, they were just cold modules. They were so tight together that you couldn't even use one without another. Um, it, it was just a kind of fake modular thing. And we switched into an architecture that looks much like this. So we have a, extracted a domain model in the middle, three use cases, some services around them, and then at the end, the, the final circle is the environment. So either we have a glass fish or something else. So for the first approach, where we wanted to use Java Enterprise, JSF, Glassfish, and so forth, we use it all together, the domain model, the use cases, CJB controllers, JPA persistence, and so forth. Now, in a database. Now, next thing I showed you was a Spring Boot application, which just used a few things of those. It just used the domain model and the catalog service. It provided its own in-memory persistence, and Spring Boot was uh, able to run it. Next thing was a standalone OSGI application, which pr was pretty much the same concept, except uses OSGI services and OSGI runtime. And finally, we used a portal server where we created a portlet and used the exact same functionality to display things in a portlet. OK, I wish I was able to tell you that I'm so smart that I created this thing myself, I mean, like the concept. But that is actually a well-known concept. If you read Uncle Bob's articles and, and posts, you've probably seen this thing called clean architecture. And that is essentially what I was showing you today. And moving from a mess of code, a monolithic mess of code, into a clean architecture, I didn't move it to microservices. I didn't say microservices is going to solve my problem. I just cleaned my architecture so I can use it later on any way I wish, using microservices with or without microservices in OSGI, in Portos, or uh, whatever. So what is the main message. Main message is modularity is a very important thing. You need to write modular applications. And by modular, it does not mean put some code in a different folder on your file system. That's not modularity. But you need to design it in a way that you have modules, that, that they have uh, explicit contracts, and you can use them uh, with or without other modules. But you don't really have to have microservices in order to do that. You can do that 
just by applying rules like clean architecture and, and, and common sense. So that's the, um, for us, for LifeRay, hey, who here has heard about LifeRay? Okay, so we're not that unknown here. Um, uh, so for us, uh, OSGI happened to be the way, we, uh, uh, the way to go. We decided that that is the platform that give us basically all the benefits of, of modularity and like microservices like without forcing us into going uh, with a uh, always distributed, always rest, all the overhead and so forth. And now as you can see, a lot of other guys have chosen that architecture. And if you s dig into what OSGI gives you, you will realize that the points that I showed you earlier that are related strictly to software development, not to organizational culture, but software development, are much the same. OSGI is going to give you the exact same thing that microservices give you as long as uh, uh, building an application itself is concerned. So that's why this was our, um, our choice. And uh, if you need a, um, uh, a proof, that is not a, a toy. That's a product that has four or five million lines of code. Uh, and competes with you know, names like Oracle and Microsoft. So it, it's not just a playground. We really are doing this for real. Uh, and by the way, that 80 that's uh, already old, I think it's the amount of applications is like, like 200 or so. So that's all from me for today. Feel free to find me. Uh, do we have any time for questions? I don't think so. But I think we have a few minutes. OK. Yeah. So any questions? Scare it. Uh, yeah, sure. How do you deal with development? I mean, I change a couple of lines of code. Mm -hmm. How do I deploy this? Uh, do you want some kind of build? I'll repeat the question. Oh. OK, so the question was how you deal with deployment uh, if you change a couple of lines of code. So um, there are a few things that you can do. Like OSGI allows you to deploy jars dynamically. You don't have to restart it. As you saw, I just removed the jar. It disappeared. I put it back, and it appears. So uh, we don't have uh, a, um, a way in terms of like you have to do it this way. Like what I do typically, I have an OSGI running all the time, and I have my jars symlinked to, uh, to my dev environment. So essentially, every time I compile something and I produce a jar file somewhere, it all, it's already in, in OSGI. Now, there are other tools in OSGI that ca you can set up to monitor uh, your files somewhere. The BND tool itself gives you uh, an, uh, inte nice integration with Eclipse. Uh, I don't know about other tools, but probably as well. Uh, and uh, if you have BND and Eclipse BND tools, uh, it basically monitors your project and creates bundles on the fly and, uh, and, and changes it. So it's no restarts, not at all. And uh, uh, we, we've done restarting. So. Uh, it's, it's, I would say, a milestone ahead. Yeah, I've tried the Eclipse plugin. It's pretty buggy. The, the, which one? The BND one? Yes, it's pretty buggy. OK. <laughs> I guess. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, uh, well, um, you know, it's an open source project, so they will be happy to hear your feedback, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> OK, any other questions? All right, uh, if something comes to your mind later, just find me. I'll be around all day. Uh, and um, yeah, we can talk later. OK, thank you.